erosion of sediment control. Um, hold on one second. I'm getting a message from Zoom. There, we're done with that. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, a lot of what we do is mandated by permits. We do a huge amount of installation of stormwater controls. And most of that, as I say, is required by permits. To accomplish that, we have a lot of commercial products at our disposal. We have large scale construction techniques, heavy equipment uh, to do that. Uh, when the project is done, we often look back and say, well, did we really need all that stuff? Because um, to some degree it's overbuilt, which is a good thing. You don't wanna uh, discover that you're only 80% protected in the middle of the winter, better to be 125. Um, but uh, we, don't, we don't really see the full impact of the weather. It doesn't, it doesn't hit us with its full impact. When we're done with the project, the whole project is uh, well stabilized by concrete, uh, well landscaped, it has intensive drainage. So we seldom see uh, ongoing problems. It's pretty well engineered. Um, bad things do happen. This is from the Maple Leaf Reservoir reconstruction in uh, North Seattle, and they had a, a big uh, failure of a stockpile, which overtook this guy's backyard. But when the job is done and the owner takes control, things are pretty well organized and stabilized. It's a rare project where that is not the case. By contrast, trails, well, a lot of them were never actually designed or built. They evolved from animal trails. Uh, there's one trail I worked on in Northern California that was actually built by cows. Uh, the cows are being driven to their uh, high elevation summer meadows and they chose the easiest path, which was up a stream drainage, which means that the trail they created captured the stream and it was a really unpleasant and environmentally uh, impactful route. Uh, and we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to fix what had been in place for a number of years. Uh, in building trails, we have no imported materials or heavy equipment. I always say we've got sticks and rocks and that's about it. Uh, users are hard on trails, especially stock, especially bicycles, although I haven't worked on those kind of trails, but um, building to a stock standard hikers can uh, be pretty destructive. Uh, the terrain where we find a lot of trails is pretty fragile. In this photo, they're around 10,000 feet probably have a snowpack of six to 10 feet in the wintertime and a growing season of maybe three months. Uh, so conditions are pretty, pretty hard and a poorly built trail uh, can fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, as far as maintenance, um, there's a huge inventory or a backlog of maintenance on forest service, park service, uh, even county lands, and they get to it when they can. Um, so the outcome of all this is bad trails result in decades of environmental degradation and user dissatisfaction. And by user dissatisfaction, I'm thinking of this trail in the photo where it's ugly to hike and it's difficult to walk on. You're clambering over rocks, you're walking through muck. Um, so it really, bad trails have a lot of impacts. So to do a comparison, trail and uh, urban stormwater impacts. Um, if we look at the stormwater damage uh, on urban sites, a lot of it is prevented or mitigated by best management practices. On trails, if there's stormwater damage, it happens right away and it's generally unmitigated unless uh, uh, this trail was properly designed. For corrections, the state construction stormwater permit says we must make corrections as soon as possible, no more than 10, 10 days after we discover them. On trails, corrections are made after decades or possibly never. As far as user impacts uh, or other problems, they're corrected by the time of completion. You might have a project that is plagued with failures and, and mishaps, but by the time it's turned over to the owner, it's got to be fixed. Trails, those impacts are ongoing until finally it comes to the top of the list and gets corrected. 
And in terms of environmental impacts, and I think this is one of the things we can learn from trails, um, on urban sites, a lot of those impacts are remote. You have dirty water running down the drain. You don't really see the impact that that, that will have when it reaches that stream or lake. But on trails, the uh, impacts are very local and they're very obvious. They right, they're right in front of your face, such as this trail where uh, hikers have compacted this one area. It has collected water from the adjacent meadow. So they've started hiking upslope. They've destroyed more vegetation, created more compaction, interrupted hydrology. And uh, that trail too may get sogged out and they'll make another one. So looking at impacts to trails show us what we avoid by applying urban stormwater control. So we dodge a lot of bullets and we don't necessarily appreciate it. Uh, we, get, we see just how bad stormwater damage can be. Imagine a project you're associated with, if it had no stormwater controls, uh, that would be a lot of the trails that I've walked. Um, hopefully we can also garner some ideas about how to avoid urban stormwater issues. So case in point is the West Coast Trail on Vancouver Island. Some parts are really nice, very pleasant walk in the woods. Some places uh, are almost a hellscape of decaying boardwalks and mud holes. So it's a very challenging trail. And a lot of the reason for that is precipitation. Coast Trail is on that southwest coast of Vancouver Island, right across the water from Washington State. And you can see uh, I translated the millimeters of rainfall into inches. And you can see it's in the range of hundreds of inches of rain a year. And as a matter of fact, the rainiest spot in North America is located just about 20 miles north. So they get a lot of water and they don't manage it too well. People love trail, refer to it as bogs and logs. And when you're not in a bog, you're climbing over logs. A case in point or an example. This is Angie. She has hiked this trail 15 times. She chose this music because actually she really likes this trail, despite what it takes to get through portions of it. She's been known to cover over 20 miles in a day on, in the Sierras. Here she figures 10 is a long, long day. And if you look at the her boots, you can see what kind of day she's had on this portion of the trail. So this trail has some serious erosion problems because it has either no or poorly designed uh, stormwater control. So every slope is uh, ditched out like this. Sometimes you're walking knee or even hip deep. And here they place planks to walk on and get you out of the water where you can see how well they've worked. They've almost exacerbated the problem by channeling the stormwater. And every place you have a slope, you have a beginning uh, water course, a ditch. And you get down to the bottom of the slope and you see massive sediment loss. I did a quick calculation here. This particular point on the trail is about 40 by 40 feet. It's about six feet deep on average. So that works out to 355 cubic yards, which would be about, you know, 35 and a half dump trucks that are hauling that sediment away and dumping it in a place like this. So the bottom of every slope is a giant mud hole. And I actually, uh, I've hiked this trail seven times myself and I came to find it very distressing, the condition uh, of these sites. Because what happens is you end up with all this extra sediment, it holds water, turns into a bog, hikers try to go around it and they end up destroying more and more and more vegetation. Uh, you notice the trail in the background is about two feet wide it's 30 to 40 feet wide 
in these bogs from hikers trying to avoid uh, the muck. And again, uh, that, that uh, 35 dump trucks of sediment didn't all stop here. It continues downstream. So it's had a huge impact on the, the streams in the region. In certain areas, they've built boardwalks over the wet areas. And when you look down, you see clear water. Any standing water near this is, of course, highly turbid. A cellar case is in the Sierras at the, what's called the Horse Heaven Meadow. And it is uh, heaven for horses, but it was a terrible place to hike. Once again, stock going through there had churned up the meadow into a giant mud hole. Hikers would hike higher on the slope to avoid that trails would eventually become mudded out and so they'd hike higher and higher. So when we got there, uh, it was a network of little muddy trails all over the slope and a giant bog in the bottom at the bottom of the slope. So we went to work uh, and it was not an easy project. Huge, huge cost of labor. We hauled in these logs uh, from about a quarter mile away by hand. We wheelbarrowed in gravel from the nearby stream to fill in between the logs to build a causeway. And then we packed mud and sod on the sides of the logs to take over and stabilize the causeway when the logs eventually rotted out. This is what we ended up with as a finished product. And just because I like to brag on the statistics, uh, it was about 300 feet of causeway. Uh, we dug out about 20 cubic yards by hand. Um, and uh, brought in 80 feet of logs and uh, about 100 feet of hand-placed retaining rocks and moved about 30 yards of crushed rock and gravel. Gravel by wheelbarrow, the crushed rock we made ourselves with sledgehammers. 25 years later, I came back to look at it and it is um, quite a success. You'll notice we put a series of fords through it because there's quite a bit of water that comes off the slope and needs to make it to the, the uh, meadow or the stream in the meadow. And uh, I was there in late August, early September, there was still water flowing down from that slope. So it's a very wet area, but I think uh, it's worth calling out some of the features that have made this a success. We had a, a very porous base so that water uh, could move through the ground, but also allowed for surface flow with these fords. Uh, most important, we got well above the water level, uh, had a very high water table, but we're about six to uh, 12 inches above that water table. And so we managed to keep a very dry walking surface. So 25 years later, after construction, this has only gotten better. And I would anticipate it'll still be there 50, maybe 100 years from now. <coughs> So how do we stabilize a, a trail? Well, the first thing we do is try to get a continuous outslope. And in this particular manual, they recommended three to 4%. I've always uh, used 2% as a number. Three to 4% could be a little uncomfortable to walk on and also could get a little too much velocity. But those numbers are good to remember. You don't want water moving on your site at any slope greater than that because it has more velocity, has more likelihood of eroding. Uh, the grade of the trail is also critical. If it's too steep, it's going to turn into a channel. Uh, a lot of manuals say 10% maximum, but if you're trying to get to a high mountain pass or a, a mountaintop, 10% uh, will never get you there. You'll need thousands of switchbacks and hikers uh, like to get where they're going. So they're more likely to cut those switchbacks, which creates a whole new erosion problem. So you really have to pay attention to grade. And a lot of trails are quite a bit steeper. Uh, just east of Seattle, there's the Mount Side Trail. That average is 14%. And it has uh, level areas. It even has downhill areas. So it's got areas that I would, uh, sections of the trail, I would estimate at uh, uh, 15, 18, even 20%. So the maximum grade actually depends on the soil. So obviously if you're on uh, rock or uh, talus, 
you can sustain a very steep slope because it's so porous and unerodible. If you're on silts, a lot of times you can't tolerate even 10%. You're gonna to have to have a significant water controls. You can tolerate a very steep grade uh, if you can add a few stairs. So we added uh, just three stairs here to get, uh, to make this turn. And uh, uh, I was thinking, well, what grade can you do with stairs? I measured the stairs in my house. Well, they're um, 50 to 70% grade. So you can actually manage some very steep sections with, with stairs. Downside of the stairs, very expensive. These three steps cost us about 100 worker hours. We spent, uh, four of us spent uh, four days building this. Uh, so of course we can't build stairs everywhere. We just build them in critical areas where we need to make that last final grade. So we often can't achieve the optimum outslope. And sometimes we have to have grade steeper than conditions will tolerate. So then we have to look at flow management. How do we get that water off the trail? So this is a Sierra water bar and you see these at intervals. Um, I've spent a lot of time hiking trails, just flagging water bars every uh, 50, 75 feet. We, I leave a flag to install a water bar. The idea being that, you know, again, you don't want the water to stay on the trail uh, long enough to do any damage. And of course, it's analogous to slope interruption where we install straw waddles or compost socks or terraces or whatever it might be to shorten a slope because letting that water run a greater distance is gonna do more damage. <coughs> so another illustration of trail damage is provided by this meadow trail. Once again, uh, the uh, trail route has become compacted. It collects water from the, uh, from the uh, high water table. And uh, so the trail turns into a bog. Hikers will hike alongside on the nice pleasant grass and create another trail. And very many meadows you can see are just laced with these and they have a direct impact. As I say, it's unesthetic. It's ugly to walk on. It's hard to walk on because it's rocky and it interrupts the hydrology of the meadow so that uh, uh, water does not get across the meadow as it used to. But there is another level of impact directly downstream or downslope from this meadow is this lake. And you can see by the sediment plumes, well, there's no doubt where those, that sediment comes from. It's coming right off these trails. And so again, Unlike urban sites where that water disappears and you don't really know, you have to assume it's having a damage. Here we can see the damage it's doing on uh, aquatic organisms and water quality. Uh, so there's no doubt that the problems occurring up in this meadow uh, are also causing problems in this lake. So my main advice that I would bring from this experience is we must manage the water. We look at precipitation protection, we often don't get that from trails, so we're going to have to look to something else. But on urban sites, we cover the soil with our commercial products. We want to pay attention to the flow path. Uh, in whether either trails or urban sites, we want to choose and control where the water goes. We never let it choose its own route. Um, we want to keep moving water off of dirt. That's become my new mantra. We never want moving water to touch dirt. With trails, we manage that either by getting that water off the trail or by hardening. Uh, on urban sites, we put that water in a pipe, we line channels, we install check dams, anything so that moving water never touches dirt. And finally, the impacts that we see from that water on trails, it's immediate and obvious. And so it's a little easier to know what to do. On urban sites, it's remote, but those impacts are still real. So I want to finish with an admonition I heard many times when I was a fledging trail worker. Trail work will ruin hiking for you. Um, it's also possible that expertise in erosion control will also ruin hiking for you. You'll start to notice things on the trail that are just not right from your perspective. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to entertain questions at this point.
Dave, are you there? I am there. It looks like we All don't right. have any questions. Um, how can people contact you if they think of something afterwards? Excuse me, Dave, I didn't hear that. Oh, um, how, uh, since we don't have any questions here, is there a way people can contact you if they think of something later? Uh, yes, I'll put my email in chat. And I'll be happy to entertain questions. It's uh, one of the most educational ways I've found to learn more about this business. Thank you, Carl. Okay, uh, with that, I think we'll close. Uh, again, check out our website, pnwciieca.org for lots of information and access to various things. Um, and yeah. We're going to have another presentation next Wednesday, subject to be determined. So thank you all very much for attending. And thank, thank you, you Carl. Thanks, Carl, Certainly. for doing that. Okay, see you all later.